welcome to this short video on French music and the colonialist mindset, which is a kind of deep background to the sonic accompaniments to uh, birth in the Sahara, um, which will be taking place on the 31st of March. I'm going to start with a woman's voice. Salut, She's a French woman. She's singing in Breton um, in the 1970s, and she's singing a folk song. It's a religious folk song about Christ's passion. And she's doing so using vocal techniques that have very little to do with mainstream pop or art music styles. She's using microtones. She's using very subtle inflections to decorate the melody. And we have, as you can see on the screen, a transcription of this folk song uh, from the 1920s in a slightly different version, collected by a Breton priest who was working in Paris with exiled uh, Bretons looking for work. And he published a large collection of folk songs. And this version is rather locked in by the simplicity of its Western staff notation. It can't capture the most interesting aspects of the performance. It can't capture a sense of the interpretation or indeed the style. It flattens them out into something mainstream and almost domesticated. There's another element here, which is the question of how old this folk song might be. It's likely to be centuries old. And we can tell because the, the melody is uncannily close to the Vexilla Regis plain chant hymn for Vespers which you can hear the beginning of now. Vexilla regis prodeunt, fulger crucis misterium, qua vita mortem pertulit, et morte vitam protulit. What we have with the Breton, um, the Breton example is a kind of crossover of folk and liturgical, which is very common in Brittany and gives us an idea of what it might have been to be part of the soundscape of the pilgrimages to local shrines that were an annual part of Breton life um, in the 18th, 19th and indeed early 20th centuries. So what does this have to do with North Africa or indeed colonized voices? Were we hearing with Elise Nignol, for that's her name, the voice of a colonized person? Well, I don't want to put ideas into her mind or indeed words into her mouth, but historically it's very possible that she did feel colonized. If we go back to the 1860s and the travel writer, historian and military school inspector Hippolyte Den, he says this, the French provinces were another France under the protectorate of Paris, which civilizes them and emancipates them from afar. We have the idea of distance. We have the idea of a backward community which needs to be civilized. And we have the idea of who is in charge, the protectorate of Paris. All of those things uh, apply to the colonies. So for, in this particular kind of framing, our Breton woman, Elise, is still waiting for emancipation. She's not using French. She can't be understood by the majority of her fellow citizens. And she's singing in the first person about devotion, about superstition over rationality. If we take her all together, she's a kind of internal exotic. And the history of Brittany as a region, which had to be forced to accept the rationality of the French Revolution, and 
as a permanently restless and separatist and often viewed as a barbarian land, these things help frame that view of her. Now, the values of French republicanism are absolutely crucial here, and we can go beyond liberty, equality and fraternity to ideas of unity and assimilation of things that keep the French nation together. These, of course, are becoming increasingly problematic in the era after 9-11. Multiculturalism has never been the French way. It is up to those who are different, those who are others, to assimilate to what is the norm. That is, in essence, how one becomes French. Many Bretons, uh, historical Bretons, asked why. They resisted and they gained a reputation as troublemakers. And of course, that question of civilizing is very familiar as a part of French foreign policy and empire building. If we take a comparison with the Brits, the Brits were keener on extracting raw materials and trading them. The French did this too, but they also took enlightenment thinking as a universal gold standard and planted it wherever they could. There's a first empire in America, ending in the early 19th century. And then there's overlap with Napoleon Bonaparte's failed Egyptian campaign in Egypt and Syria in 1798 to 1801. And the main starting point for the second French empire lands us in North Africa, in Algiers in 1830. It moves in the 1860s to Indochina, and then amid the general scramble for Africa, France adds the Tunisian protectorate in 1881, and finally the Moroccan protectorate in 1912. Now, how would citizens on mainland France get to know anything about musics of colonized countries or indeed more generally uh, exotic countries as they would have perceived them? I think there are two main ways. One is to bring musicians to Paris and to display them in the theme parks of the early world's fairs, thinking particularly for the purposes of this presentation of 1889 and 1900. And the second way is to compose that music or sonic uh, images of that music, if you like, um, into concert music, opera, and indeed popular music. And this, both of these are forms of domestication and control. Um, and the second gives us a very interesting relationship between the composer and the raw material that the composer is using. Saint-Saëns on the screen here is a particularly magpie-like like type of composer um, who would take raw material from anywhere. And in his Egyptian piano concerto written in Cairo, he manages in the second movement to bring together Spanish, Southern Spanish, um, quasi-African um, sounds of, uh, relating to flamenco, Egyptian sounds, um, a Nubian melody which he claimed was a love song that he heard um, sung on the Nile by a boatman, and the um, elements of the Far East of chinoiserie and uh, ideas of, the, of Japan too coming in later in the movement. This is a kind of cook's tour of exotic and colonial lands. So let me give you an even quicker cook's tour than Saint-Saëns gives us in his movement. <laughs> And the Egyptian Nile song with its drone. 
and finally to China. Some of you may have heard Ravel in that last extract, and there is certainly um, a direct line, I think, between that and Mother Goose. The authentic display mode is even more fraught, I think, the phenomenon of the human zoo. It was intended to show uh, bourgeois French audiences how successful the civilizing mission of the French empire had been and also to indicate work in progress. So you're looking at images from the 1889 Exposition Universelle which was intended to celebrate the revolution. This is where we find an Algerian café concert which French commentators called caterwauling, a Vietnamese theatre which they viewed as noisy, um, Hawaiian dancers who were regarded as too primitive really to be considered um, as dancing to music and who were conflated um, with uh, black Africans. And finally, the Javanese gamelan and its dancers, which were perceived as both hypnotic and beautiful. In 1900, there is a development from this exoticism, which is that exoticism in a way comes home. There are three European villages that take place in, within the theme park. The first is Old Paris, a medieval papier mache version um, of, the, of the city. There is a touristic picturesque Swiss village. And then there is a Breton village. And quite interestingly, the Breton village was lobbied for by Bretons themselves because they wanted to display their difference amid everything else within the theme park. They wanted to bring elements of their own identity. And it's, or in some ways, it's a kind of auto-exoticism. So my question is, does this take us back to Elise Nignol and her... Um, Chant de la Passion, her, her folk song right at the beginning? And the answer is no, because what we're dealing with here is the folkloric rather than the folk. What was sung at the Breton Cabaret as part of this universal exposition um, was chanson by uh, Théodore Botrel, who was one of the most famous songwriters of the period, who made a great deal of money out of touristic Brittany um, about songs about maritime culture. And his most famous song was an image of the girl from the fishing village of Bampol, which he hadn't actually visited when he wrote the, um, he wrote the song. He used to dress up in a historic Breton costume and to all intents and purposes, he presented a domesticated version of what um, Breton folk culture might be. So these tensions of folk and folkloric in French art and popular music remind us that some of the problems of musical difference in colonial France were mirrored on the mainland itself on a smaller and sometimes more subtle and less cruel scale. The core attitude though is similar. There are norms and there are others and it's up to others to find a way to assimilate to the norm and that's effectively what Botrel did. Right. 
And in case you're not still not convinced by this analogy, I want to take you back to the Hawaiian dances of the 1889 exposition and to compare them with uh, a, a folk bagpipe competition in Brest in 1895. And you'll see that the framing of these two pictures is identical. We see the bourgeoisie with their backs to us observing something that is exotic. Now, the bagpipers are dressed up in their Sunday best. They're dressed very much as Bottrell would, would have uh, dressed to sing his chanson. But they're still exotic and other, and there's still that difference between their audience and them as exhibits. So this is what French colonialism looks like, or French musical colonialism looks like. How it sounds, of course, and how it differs from its models requires careful teasing out. And I thought I would close by just reminding you of how Elise Nignol sings her folk song. Salut, Thank you for listening.